You're watching HuffPost Live. I'm Nancy Red, and this conversation is presented by Monster, where you can search millions of jobs to help you find better. Now, have you ever said to yourself, oh, I could totally use a vacation? Or do you find yourself saying that every day or every hour of every day? Well, actions speak louder than words. And according to a survey by the travel website Skift, over 40% of Americans didn't take a single vacation day in 2014. That's crazy. What's behind America's obsessive work ethic? And what are the ways that a better work-life balance can help? Well, joining me to discuss, we have a great panel, starting with Professor Lonnie Golden, a labor economist at Penn State University. Yeah. Tosh Jeffries, a former management consultant who's now a stretch management expert. And here with me on set, we have Cara Lemieux. She's a digital communication strategist and the founder of CPL Communications. Thank you all so much for being here. All right, Tosh, I gotta get started with you. Are you surprised that so many people are not taking their vacation days? 40%, Tosh, that's crazy. Yeah, it is crazy, Nancy, and I'm not surprised because uh, most of us are exposed to this idea of I gotta be the first in, I gotta be the last out in order to get ahead and succeed. So with so many people wanting to be their best and do it that way, it's, it's, it's hard for you to stop and say, hold on, I need to regroup, I need to regenerate myself, and I need to come back to being refreshed again. So I'm not surprised at all. Absolutely, and you're not just talking about your friends, you're talking about yourself. For years, you were a management consultant. You were at the top of your game, kicking butt, taking names. But what you saw on the outside wasn't exactly what was happening on the inside, right? That job was wearing you down. Yes, and wore me down so much that I actually got viral meningitis in December of 2011, and it was a wake-up call for me, and that's actually what transitioned me to do so much work with stress management and with work-life balance and with health and lifestyle management because, yeah, that's, oh, that brings back so many memories to see that image. It, it was painful, and I learned my lesson the hard way. Well, here's the thing. When you got sick at first, was the first thought, oh no, I hope I get better, or oh no, I hope my job is okay with me being sick? Uh, my very first thought, honestly, was I know I'm meant to do something with this. What am I supposed to do with this? And I started thinking about my family. Now, uh, 2011 was also a rough year because I also lost my oldest brother to cancer that year. So the first thing I thought was, no, there, this is happening for a reason. I meant to do something with this. So it, it really wasn't the job. It's not that it wasn't important, but it was one of the last things that came up in my mind. The first thing was, I can do something with this. I have a huge opportunity, so what am I going to do? Lonnie, and that's why I want to get you in here, because when we're talking about this, here's, we're lucky that Kara is brilliant and can figure out when it's time to make a change. We're lucky that Tosh uh, knows when it's time to make a change. But not everyone knows when it's time to take it, make a change or also what kind of change to make. Let's talk about your recent study, okay? Work hours and worker happiness in the U.S., weekly hours, hours preferences, and schedule flexibility. Now, you actually found that it wasn't the amount of hours that people were working were making you unhappy, right? Let's talk about that. You'd think that people who work over 40 hours are always going to be unhappy, but that's not exactly true. What's going on? Well, what we think is going on is that some workers find it advantageous to work longer hours. That can be because their job is really stimulating or enjoyable, or as uh, the other guests alluded to, particularly managerial and professional workers, can find it really alluring because it creates opportunities for them for promotion, for raises, because they're displaying this work ethic by always being present. Now, we do know that there are some potential consequences on the downside of that, but what we also find is some people who work really long hours also get more flexible daily schedules, so when they're on that verge of burning out or fatiguing to leading to mistakes or errors, they can maybe um, pull themselves away from the cliff. Now, we also find that among hourly workers, when you're paid by the hour, there's the additional lure, of course, of the overtime pay, but the nature of that work might not be quite as alluring. So maybe the distinction is about those who are working in the salary jobs where there's a great payoff to working longer hours, particularly in the longer run, and other types of jobs that don't. Right. Well, in that study, I, w I worked with a colleague who studied European workers, particularly in Western Europe, and they find pretty much the opposite, that 
that uh, folks who put in the long hours are really unhappy because they value their leisure time so much. And maybe what's happening in the U.S. is there are good reasons to work long hours because we need additional income. The inequality is growing, so the lure of putting in the space time to get that promotion or raise is more intensified in the U.S. And consequently, we deal with the work-life imbalance as sort of a side issue. But you know what? We're becoming more nuanced in our conversations when we talk about this, Cara. When did you realize, you know, I need a change. I'm working these overnight shifts at network television station. I'm exhausted. There has to be a better way. I mean, I think it was gradual. It wasn't I, I had this aha moment. I will say I really had um, a wake-up call. I was about six and a half, seven months pregnant, and I was working in the control room, and I started having contractions, preterm contractions. So I had to go on bed rest for a few weeks, and that was, I think, when I first realized um, and really absorbed the fact that there was another entity other than myself involved now in my life. Um, so I had always known I wanted to sort of head out of those overnight hours. I just think getting pregnant and having a daughter sort of sped up that process for me. And it sped up the process, but you handled it like a pro. You handled it very gradually, staying in a field you're comfortable with when in a different environment. How did that help your transition and help you uh, ease into figuring out what works for you, what works for your mental health and your family? I mean, I love communications. I love communicating. That's why I'm here right now. Um, so I just really started to look at which aspects of the industry I really enjoyed. And, um, you know, it was also at a time when, you know, consumer, like, viewer habits were changing and more and more people were getting their information and their content from the Internet. So I started to really see how that would fit into just not only a professional life that I wanted, but also a personal life that I wanted um, and give me some more flexibility. Absolutely. Tosh, when we have these conversations, frequently people think, well, I've just got to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, I'm just going to like completely revamp my entire life, have nothing to do with the previous life. Well, it doesn't work that way. Like Kara said, you can have parts of your life that you really like, that you glean onto, that you turn into this wonderful, fulfilling work experience at a different job. Absolutely. And, and that's why one of the things that I, I work with people to find is, again, like you said, Nancy, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater and saying, let's make lifestyle changes, sustainable changes. So even if it's one thing that you add into your day, like I'm a huge advocate for everyone setting aside, even if it's five minutes a day where they just do something they love. It could be listening to music. It could be going for a walk. It could be reading a bedtime story to your, your son or daughter, whatever that is, but fitting those types of things into your day because they also help um, protect you against burnout and overwork and forgetting what you're doing it for. Uh, so it's the small changes that really matter. And when you do enough of them, it actually turns into a larger lifestyle. So it's sustainable on a daily basis. Well, and also just having a moment. I think what happens is when you don't take vacation, Cara, uh, they, they, you just think, well, I just need to just give this up completely, or I just need to get out of the office. And you and I have both been there, right? We have worked from home, and we, we said, you know what? My whole life is going to be somewhat of a vacation, even though I'm working. That doesn't make one any happier. No, it's, I think it's all about configuring everything in the arrangement that works best for you. Um, now that I'm working from home, and, you know, I see clients on occasion, but most of my time I'm in my home office, which is a separate area. But I'm by myself for like eight, nine hours a day. And that's, I don't think, great for me either. So I'm trying to figure out exactly how I, what I do to offset that. You know, I've made sure to join CrossFit so that it's like, you know, a social exercise experience. Um, and then also really reevaluating like, okay, what parts of this work from home environment do I enjoy? And then what else do I want to work into this so that I am getting that collaborative human interaction that I really, really thrive off of and makes me the best worker possible. Absolutely. And, and these shared experiences that you glean from help you to be more productive, having this uh, wealth of information and having these moments of just time alone. Here's the thing. I want to talk about vacations because one of the things that we have wrong in America is people don't even get a chance to figure it out because we don't even go on vacation like I mentioned. I want to pull up a piece from earlier this year and it is entitled Japan is considering making vacation mandatory. The U.S. should 
too. Lonnie, what's your take? Because when you talked earlier about the research showing that people in European countries have a completely different take, it's actually because they have a vacation culture and we don't. Do you think vacations would be mandatory? Do you think it could help uh, worker happiness? I think it would be really helpful to not leave, as we do in the U.S., workers to do this all on their own and, and to have to make these tough choices day to day. So what we need is not only the individual coaching or individual self-discipline to take time off when you're on the verge of burnout or, um, or fatigue or work-family imbalance, but you need an organizational culture which supports people using existing paid vacation time that they might get from their employer, and we need an overall minimum standard nationally which sends a signal to organizations and individuals that it's safe to use this, at least for a few days a year or a few months uh, or for a few uh, hours per month, because there will be sort of a race to the bottom when uh, we have a work ethic and it's very competitive, and particularly after the recession, people feel so insecure that they could take time off, but they're kind of in fear that someone will get their job or pick up some of their tasks, or their work will pile up too much when they're away, uh, when they're away and they'll, they'll lose their theme of productivity. So we need an overall background of uh, national culture backed by legislation. And that's exactly what we're advocating in reports on helping authors for the Economic Policy Institute, which is there should be some minimum vacation time uh, that's paid, minimum paid time off for sick leave, a right to request uh, flexible schedules, temporarily going to part-time so that you can cope with life changes like some of your guests are experiencing and get through that only temporarily and go back to longer hours then. But right now it's just individuals trying to cope with uh, on their own. And I, 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 even though you can't really check your study for this, I can't help but wonder how much of this is fear based. We just have taken it for granted that it's normal. Uh, we have two completely different comments here. One from Rick. He says, to working over 40 hours and not taking a vacation does not equate to a workaholic is dedication, loyalty, and focus. Why are you coming at this with the idea that working over 40 hours is a bad thing? Focus on that mindset above all else. We're not necessarily saying that, but what it can create is a culture where people are genuinely afraid just to have a moment to themselves. Like we have right here, Tarana, she says, that's always my first thought. I can't afford to get sick. In fact, I said it last week while having three deadlines, and guess what? I got sick. What's worse, I still went to work. I need a break a real one. And we need to kind of figure out how to give ourselves permission to take these breaks or to give our our employers a way to express their permission. Earlier this year, the CFO of Google actually published a resignation letter that went viral detailing why he walked away from a lucrative job. He said, in the end, life is wonderful, but nonetheless a series of trade-offs, especially between business, professional endeavors, and family and community. And thankfully, I feel I'm at a point in my life where I no longer have to make such tough choices anymore. And for that, I am truly grateful. All right, here's the thing, Taj. Is it inspiring, or are you just kind of like, dude, how did you get to that point? Isn't that the goal? Did you, was it the 120-hour work weeks that got you to the point where you could just say, you know what, I'm done? You know what? At the end of the day, I think some of us forget and, and take for granted that we're going to be here another day. And the thing is, once you get so sick that you can't even enjoy everything that you put in that time for, you, you sit and say, well, what was the point? And so I actually agree. And if you're at a point where you understand what your life is meant for, what you want it to be filled with, we all get to make a choice. And another thing about the time off and the vacation you work for it. It's not like you have vacation sitting there and it just magically shows up. You actually have to work for it in most cases. So it's the equivalent of you know having a bank account with $10,000 and leaving it sit there and not doing it with doing anything with it. And nobody would do that in a rational world. So if you've earned these days and you've earned the right to step back and say, listen, I'm just going to focus on me for a week, whether you go away or whether you do a staycation at home, why would you not take it and fill yourself back up so that you're actually more productive when you get back to work? And I think that needs to be start, start to be the question that people ask themselves when they're looking at, do I stay or do I go? Do I take vacation or do I not? I also think that, you know, when you're on vacation, if you do actually pull yourself away, it's also recognizing it's very difficult to pull yourself away from email. 
Um, because if you're still thinking about work and reading all your emails, I mean, I still consider that to be working in some capacity. So that's sort of been, especially being self-employed, you don't get paid for your vacation. Um, so that's another component. But I've really been trying to make a concerted effort to at least have one 24-hour period over the weekend where I do not go anywhere near my email. I'm working on it. I'm not <laughs> saying that I've succeeded. But I I'm recognize... <laughs> Are you trying to, girl? Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing. You recognize what? I was going to say, I recognize that I'm much better and much more productive after I take that break from communication and constantly being on and thinking about, you know, writing and responding to people and all that stuff. So that's sort of my reward in the way I'm convincing myself, like, you know what, you can disconnect every once in a while and then get a lot more done when you do re-engage. And it's, it's, it's advice like that that's so important. I actually want to play a video from one of our viewers about her struggle with work-life balance. Let's take a look. I'm 54, I've raised three beautiful sons, and almost lost my mind because of my dream jobs. Uh, it is essential for me that I'm in balance, and that frankly means that I'm always being the best mom I can be. It's okay not to be the best employee, but it can never be acceptable not to be the best mom you can be. I think the bottom line you need to know is that there'll always be another dream job. So live your life honestly and for your kids. Cara, does that resonate with you? It actually does. I mean, I think I'm very fortunate that I was able to have what I considered to be my dream job before I had to worry about anyone other than myself. Um, you know, I absolutely loved being a producer at Good Morning America. I love the control room. I love the adrenaline rush. I love the camaraderie, the people, all of that stuff. I was just really, really tired by the time um, I had been there for a few years. So I feel like I had the dream job and now I'm looking for sort of the dream configuration of like a job and life, um, which is still difficult for me to sort of resolve the conflict between the two because I am very used to throwing myself 100% into exactly what's in front of me. All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining me. And there's plenty more about this topic in our resource web below. Remember, this conversation has been presented by Monster, where you can search millions of jobs to help you find better.